layers of a person's skin. Whether this made any difference to her then, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that on a summer afternoon a few years later, in a restaurant with her and that daughter, who was probably about three by then, my mother reached a hand to stroke the child's bare thigh. Oh, so soft, she said. And I thought, oh, she's seeing past the color to the texture, past the first two layers, to the evident sweetness of my child, her beautiful grandchild. Of course, I realize that we can't go around randomly stroking each other in order to change our body <laughs> politic. That might be fun, though, huh? <laughs> but I offer this story only as evidence that people's perceptions can change. And as far as I can see, seem to be changing right in front of me. And unless the politics of our nation keep up with and interact with the nation's body politic, we will be constrained by outmoded ideas that truly do not reflect the will of the citizenry. We have to speak up. We have to participate. But how? Let's go back a few years and consider just when public transportation was desegregated. Ha! Have any of you ever ridden on segregated public transportation? Oh, one person. Aha. Uh -huh. Have you studied Rosa Parks and the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott? Most probably, yes. OK, I can't expect you to know everything, but it was 1956. That's not that long ago. Would it ever occur to you now to wait for a bus or a train or a plane that would take only white or black people? Does it now seem bizarre or foolish? Or at the very least, a terrible waste of everyone's time and fuel? I'll offer another illustration, one that goes even further back. I graduated high school in June 1951 and decided to go to a woman's college because I was very attracted to men, had already had unprotected sex, and was sure I'd find myself pregnant in a hot minute. Access to birth control then being another horrible story. Because I was smart, I was accepted at Vassar, but decided not to go there because not only didn't I want to get pregnant, I also didn't want to become one of those girls from Queens who became a snob at Vassar. So I went instead to Mary Washington College in Fredericksburg, Virginia. As of that moment, I had never been farther south than Freehold, New Jersey, where my uncle had a chicken farm. So I get there to Fredericksburg, and the roommates to whom I'd been aside didn't want to live with me. Why? This was September 1951, and I was not only a northerner, but a Jew. Eventually, I found some like-minded people to live with, and I found the South to be a very good place to learn some important lessons about America. I have never regretted my decision to go there, and I did very well because I had no trouble at all with religion as long as I wasn't going to get pregnant by it. As for that college, now a university, I can personally attest to its current integration because I have relatives of color who've graduated from it recently. But I don't want to give you the impression that race and religion are of equal import when we're discussing perception and politics. Race is still the primary divisor. I don't have any statistics at hand, but I'm quite aware that there are many US citizens who have never had a simple interracial interaction. Of course, I am full of stories about this because in the midst of trying to do my work and keep on pushing for whatever reason, I have forgotten that my approach to life might vary from that of others. So I'm always having lovely conversations. The subway is great for this, of course. One morning, not long ago, I sat down beside a young black man while waiting for the six or the R, can't remember which. 
He sort of shifted a bit to accommodate me and then said, good morning. Well, good morning to you, I said, surprised. How nice of you to greet me. Well, isn't that what you're supposed to do, he asked. I can't remember what I answered, but the fact that he was doing what he had been brought up to do, greet an older lady, has stayed with me. We are offered so many possibilities in this great city that we don't take advantage of out of reticence, reluctance, or self-involvement, or simple subway etiquette. But there is always the possibility that one can subvert them. Try it. You'll be surprised how many responses you'll get. Nevertheless, I hope it's not too long a leap from personal responsibility to institutional opportunity. I want to repeat that. Personal responsibility to institutional opportunity. Of course, we all know about changing real estate in what we call greater New York. But maybe if you don't yet have children, you might not be paying attention to the recent ruckus, which like many previous ruckuses, is that a word, ruckuses? It has to do with school districts. If you want to send your kid to the good school, you have to live within a prescribed area. And if you don't live there, you have to either move there or borrow someone's address who qualifies. This has been going on since my own children were of elementary school age, and I had to borrow someone's address in order to send them to school in the West Village. The solution to the problem is, of course, not real estate itself, but real investment on the part of the Board of Education. Just beef up the school in the bad district, and suddenly, like magic, real estate will evolve, will, will, values will skyrocket. It's such an obvious solution, but it's a political solution involving pressure on city institutions and those who supposedly serve us. Ideally, there should be no distinction between good and bad public schools, both elementary and secondary. There should be no distinction in the infrastructure that houses these schools. But again, the solution to this problem lies in the participation of the body politic, us. Yet, of course, this is a question of which came first, the chicken or the egg? Recently, my polling place was changed from a site across the street to one five blocks away. Don't ask me why, ask the Board of Elections. Anyway, my new place to vote was in the school to which I had refused to send my children 50 years ago, having learned through the grapevine that it was not only inadequate, but awful, and that awful word, dangerous. Well, 50 years is enough time for a neighborhood to change. And when I walked in to vote, I was delighted to see a well-maintained, cheerful-looking place, just like I thought the neighborhood itself. And when I spoke to the woman who was in charge for the day, she assured me that, oh, yes, this is considered one of the best elementary schools around. On my way home, I did indeed regret that I had capitulated and not personally fought for the institutional health of the place, but instead sent my children to public schools out of the district. But the fact remained that the neighborhood, the people, of course, not the infrastructure, had gradually changed because people who moved there had demanded that the school respond to the needs of their children, thus attracting more people because of the better schools. It seems so simple. But this, after all, is one city. Why are we even talking about one city school being better than another? Because this is one city. Schools with some leeway should offer a standard curriculum from daycare on. I went to kindergarten and first grade in Brooklyn, second grade in one part of Queens, and from third to eighth in another than high school in far Rockaway. I never, in any of those locations, encountered anything I hadn't seen before or been prepared for. 
This is not to say everything is now hunky-dory. When my aforementioned daughter was in middle school in the 70s, her sewing teacher objected to the African print fabric my daughter had chosen for her skirt project. She came home in tears and I went to the school in high dudgeon. Why, I asked of the flustered teacher who was having a bit of trouble matching me to the child she knew. Well, it's the pattern, she stuttered. It will, it will be, be, be too hard to make the hem hem with the pattern pattern. But if I help, I asked, and of course she agreed. But I was so angry that when I got back to the street, I leaned on the wall of the school and wept because this woman's perception included not only African print fabric, but entire lack of knowledge of and acquaintance with my daughter's paternal family who were professional seamstresses and tailors for the University of South Carolina. They could and did make suits, woolen suits. My assignments for this address today has been to explain or discuss or reveal, if I am able, how perception and politics interact in polyphonic ways. This, of course, takes us right back to the literal definition of why I'm here, to urge you to notice, to perceive, and thus become aware that polyphonic is many-voiced, and thus the continuation of a peaceful public life is the responsibility and duty of every citizen who benefits from public services. I remind you of this because so very often we take a great deal for granted. But I want you to know that you don't have to reinvent the wheel in order to accomplish what might be a contribution to the polyphonic body politic. See if you can say that. There are features of this neighborhood that didn't exist when I moved here at the beginning of 1962. The Museum of the City of New York has some great photos if ever you're interested. But check out the trees around here. Not only the beauties in Cooper Union's little front yard, but the ones who live miraculously in the sidewalk holes. On Fifth Street between Second and Third, there were none, believe me, not one tree until a guy who had just moved there organized the neighbors, and they all planted the trees that are now four stories tall. Trees grow fast, it seems. My downstairs neighbor and I planted the one outside our building at 27 Cooper Square in honor of a third neighbor who unfortunately had died young. Maybe that was 20 years ago? I can't remember. But anyway, that tree is all the way up to the fourth floor where I live and protects me from any prying eyes from the NYU students across the street when I am getting dressed in the morning. <laughs> what else can you do to participate in the polyphonics of this wonderful place? If you have some ideas, I want to hear them. The most important thing to remember is that there are way more possibilities than you yourself have imagined. For example, as was mentioned, I got a civic engagement grant from the new school where I teach to teach at the Lower East Side Girls Club. When I was making arrangements and mentioned girls, the director of the club said, oh no, we want you to teach the moms of our girls. That was a few years ago, and we've moved the venue to the Bowery, but some of the original group is still with me, and at each session there might be new women. If you're a rich mom, you can take a class in writing at the 92nd Street Y for $425 for eight weeks. But if you're not rich, who will offer you an outlet, a bit of creativity? During the years when you're mired in responsibility and any time for creativity is hard to come by, 
This is civic engagement at its best to offer ongoing enrichment to people who may or may not have had a college education, but who might jump at the chance to study art of any stripe with an enthusiastic teacher. There are ways one can get grants for such work, as I have done, which apart from the money aspect would make you, as well as those you teach, yet another piece of the polyphonic body politics. Say it twice. And of course, you'll have to learn how to pronounce it. Thank you for listening. And I remember them because I'm going to read a story and some poems before I go, OK? Polyphonic body politic. Can you all say it? <laughs> Polyphonic body politic. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Reading aloud, you have to have a lot of juice. I write stories and poems. I write anything that happens. <laughs> Any, this, I'm going to write, read a little story called, for want of a better title, The First Line, which is, this time it was different at the airport. This is time I waited with the family of my daughter's friend. The mother, an entertaining woman, light-skinned in Harlem, reared with funny stories about being mistaken all her life for what she wasn't. Beside her was her mother, an elegant 60-year-old from Jamaica, hiding 15 braids in a woolen hat. Although she admired my braids, she thought herself too old for them, she told me, but her granddaughters had just done her hair, and it seemed a shame to take out all that work just to go to the airport. The teenage girls of whom she spoke were also along, as was the boyfriend of the eldest daughter of this family, whom they were all there to meet. I was meeting my daughter, too. On my other side, a second family waited. I'd been watching them in the lounge, admiring their genealogy, their geniality, a man and a woman and their two adolescent daughters. I didn't know they were meeting the same plane until we were all standing together, all of us peering down the tunnel to gate 20. Apparently, they had also come for a daughter. It was 1984, and all these daughters were coming home from South America together. The plane arrived. There's my mommy, my daughter shouted loud enough for everyone in the airport to hear as we barged through the crowd and whirled each other around. And I think I was shouting too by this time, yelling, yay. Then we all went to the baggage claim and I had time to say hello to my daughter's friend and the daughter who belonged to this other family, this Puerto Rican union official and his wife from Co-op City to whom I was introduced along with their younger daughters. The low ceiling terminal rang with the shrieks of little sisters, howls of laughter, commands, get that big tan box, that's mine. Everyone seemed to be smiling the same size smile, which made them look curiously alike, as though we were all one family, my daughter later said. And when the union official and I found ourselves suddenly face to face at the luggage carousel, we smiled again even wider a man and a woman, of course, smiling at each other as those combinations do. But because of the event, welcoming home these wonderful 20-year-old daughters, it felt as if we were smiling with some rare and significant understanding of what life might provide if only you grit your teeth and hang on hard enough. The first time, it was different at the airport. The first time my daughter had gone, all by her shapely little 14-year-old self, all the way to Greece to work as a mother's helper. Her sister went to visit L Loretta, their paternal grandmother. It was the first time they'd both been away at once, my first six weeks alone in more than 15 years. I'd spent most of my time tearing down a ceiling 
Of course, a single person head of household also has to work, forgive the irony. So every evening after a bath to wash off the ceiling and a walk with my dogs for a little exercise, I edited a book about how to nurse a wild animal back to health if you happen to find one on the road. The manuscript was typed on erasable bond. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that, erasable bond. And the words kept coming off on my arms as it was a very hot summer with day after day over 90 degrees. So the six weeks passed quickly with little communication except for a couple of letters from the daughter in Greece and phone calls from her sister. I can't say I missed them. I appreciated the free time. And except for greeting my neighbors when I walked the dogs, I rarely spoke to anyone. In solitude, we store up feelings, I think. And if you're busy and don't talk much, especially to anyone who might ask, how are you? There's little incentive to assess how you are. You just are. So when it came time to claim my daughter, I was neither delighted nor dismayed by her imminent arrival. It was merely the day of it. It was raining. At the airport, I had an umbrella with me. There was a crowd waiting for this particular flight from Athens. Mostly a lot of white folks come to get returning vacationers. I say white folks because this is who I saw. After years of mothering black children and being responsible for their safety, my sight lines have been reconstructed. All the ankles bent, the light reflected, refracted. I must point out that this is not a hostile, but a defensive position. Despite who I am, it is necessary that I see who I see, and I saw who I saw then. I leaned on my umbrella and waited with them. As I said, I wasn't excited because maybe I was alone with no one to turn to and say, isn't it late? Are you sure it's flight 203? Check the letter. So this isolated me even more from the white folks who were all gabbing and whose little children swung on the velvet rope that held us like the proscenium holds the audience a seemly distance from the closed door to customs. Then the plane arrived and after a while the passengers straggled out one or two at a time hauling luggage. There was an opening in the rope where a guard stood. At this point the arrivals met their relatives, loved ones I might say, but it didn't seem like that to me. No one kissed, aside from a decorous peck on the cheek. There were no loud cries of hello and how are you and how was the trip, no hugs and back slaps, just some proper little kisses, not even on the lips. Then my daughter appeared. I had glanced away for a moment and looking back caught sight of her all at once as though she'd been born on that spot in all her dear familiarity, her hair grown to the point it makes when it needs to be cut, her light brown skin burned a deep velvety shade. She was laden like a little burro. Suitcases, packages, olive baskets hung from her, and not in any wild surmise could I have foreseen my response, for it was as if all the love I had ever felt for her came rushing from my heart and impelled me toward her, and I broke the rules, ducked the rope, and ran, yelling her name. We met in the middle on stage, as it were. Oh, I've lost my place. I got so excited. <laughs> she, my little warm girl, pressed herself close, straining around her burdens to hug me while I threw my arms around what I could reach of her with such force that the umbrella flew from my hand. And as it cluttered across the marble floor of the terminal, she whispered, oh, I've never been so glad to see my mommy in my life. That was what I heard in one ear. In the other came the uneasy sound of an audience that wasn't sure whether to laugh. So that when my daughter and I released each other and I went to get my umbrella, I became less inclined to melodrama and more directed toward the fact that we were the usual public attraction, all this, although this time my fault entirely, for more than the usual reasons. For thus, in those years, 
there'd begun to be a new aspect to race. The nature of the hostility we faced had changed. About the same height, we'd sometimes walk with linked arms, but it was still uncommon to see women embraced on the street. And I'd begun to catch shocked, white or angry black glances that meant, what are those two chicks doing together? This bothered me mostly for their sakes as adolescents. It's hard enough without extras. But it's hard, too, to be denied one's mother love. And at the airport, though aware of the continued speculative murmur around us and some giggles, I was too overcome with love to care as I clutched my daughter and her bundles and we propelled each other toward the exit. I can't recall even seeing another face until we reach the rubber mat that makes a path to the automatic door and I noticed coming toward us as we fumbled a basket, a black man, a porter. As he passed, he said clearly, but with a tonal ambivalence, well, somebody glad to see somebody. I stopped walking then because everything was falling anyway and glanced behind me intending to catch this man's eye. In the entire airport terminal, there were two people of color and me, and one I had given birth to. And having had to endure white folks' unease, I felt I couldn't also any longer endure black folks' disaffection. For if the world was to be divided and I couldn't include myself with them forever, it seemed to me I would have no stake in my own future. So I wanted to acknowledge this man, the way understanding people acknowledge each other when there are a few of them in a room, as he had even so ambivalently acknowledged us. I wanted to smile and say, sir, this is my daughter, my daughter, home from across the sea. But his back was turned, and how was I to call him? Mr. Porter, sir, turn around and take a closer look. Watch us when we smile. He was gone, though. That was all he had to say. And how had he really felt? Anyway, I guess. Such were the times then, and the wars. It seems silly even to speculate about it. Still, his tone stayed with me. Well, somebody glad to see somebody. And I thought about him for years. He became for me the misconnection in that arena of false assumption where interracial love is always eros, never storge, only sexual, never familial. So optimist that I am, I guess I was looking for him again this time at the airport. Not that I expected him, not really. I never expect anything except signs to interpret. But as I said, I see who I see, and it was his understanding I took in the union man's smile, as if it could forever lay that first time to rest, lay rest suspicion and apprehension, so a bygone troubled time can't come again, no matter how hard the new times become. Thank you. I think I'll end there. That's a good place. Thank you. Thank you.